No matter your career field, whether you like it or not, a huge part of your work will involve communicating with colleagues, coworkers, or superiors. Most often, this communication will be done in writing. This video will help you develop the fundamental skills necessary to write effective emails, letters, and memos in workplace environments. These skills include things like writing concisely, designing effective documents, writing in a professional tone, audience awareness, and communicating with a clear purpose. To start, let's talk about the larger field of professional and technical communication. What is professional writing, and how is it different from academic or creative writing? Put simply, when you engage in professional writing, you are often representing an entity larger than yourself. This entity could be a Fortune 500 corporation or a local mom-and-pop business, but either way, when you write, you aren't just writing as an individual. Often, we refer to this as a professional ethos or persona. Basically, you adopt a tone of voice, set of standards, and sense of character that reflects your workplace instead of just you, your individual self. Have you ever dressed up in more formal attire for a job interview? If so, on some level, you were trying to represent yourself in a more professional way. This doesn't mean you were pretending to be someone else. It's still the same you underneath the suit, after all. It just means that you recognize a level of formality to be observed in the workplace and you wanted to highlight the aspects of your own personality that aligned with that professional environment. Our speaking and writing works in the same way. Part of professional writing, then, is to make sure that you know how to quote-unquote dress your writing in a way that helps it come across as clean, precise, and in line with the expectations of the workplace. The other important aspect of professional writing is that, much like a business, it facilitates action, provides a service, or focuses on production. For example, an email can facilitate action by simply asking for a reply. A report can provide a necessary service by helping people make a critical decision. A well-designed instruction set focuses on production by clearly explaining how a user can perform a task. This third example, the instruction set, is a type of communication that often gets labeled as technical writing. The word technical and technique come from the same Greek root word, techne, meaning knowledge about making and doing. Technical writing is very much action-oriented in that it guides readers through the process of accomplishing a specific task. A good recipe is technical writing in the same way that a set of IKEA instructions is. They both help a person with no prior knowledge make or construct something. While it's important to understand the differences between technical and professional writing, you will likely encounter them working together to produce a truly effective document. For example, a good set of instructions must have material that focuses specifically on guiding the user through a process, but it must also be well designed visually and textually as well as demonstrate a knowledge of purpose and audience. For this video, our focus will be on three common types of professional writing, but you will find that a basic understanding of technical writing skills, like writing instructions, will often come into play in these documents. The major examples of professional writing we will be discussing today are the email, letter, and memo. Each of these three genres have their own strengths and weaknesses, so it's important to think through when it's most appropriate to utilize each one. I'll discuss each of these in a bit more detail first before we look at examples of each. First, the genre you're most likely familiar with, or at least have the most practice writing, is the email. An email is a digital-born document meaning that it did not exist before the widespread use of computers or the internet. This is important to remember because it means that the email does not suffer some of the same limitations as other print-based forms of communication. This is the main reason why the email has become the dominant form of professional communication in the 21st century. In fact, most long-form letters and memos are actually transmitted digitally now through email as attachments. Of course, 
digital texts have their own downfalls as well. For example, unlike a print letter, you can never truly get rid of an email. Digital records are much more difficult to quote, burn after reading, than a piece of physical paper, and much easier to copy and share instantaneously across the globe. This means that it is of extreme importance that you do not type anything in an email correspondence that you don't want to be public and permanent. Remember, everything you write is potentially just one share away from going viral. Another major downfall of the email and other digital texts is how easy it is to ignore them. After a few days, unread emails automatically get shuffled to the bottom of an invisible pile and possibly ignored. Emails can be accidentally deleted with one false click. Emails don't take up physical space on a person's desk. Despite these reasons, email still remains the dominant form of communication due to the speed at which they can be sent and received the multiple types of media they can transmit, and the ease with which they facilitate communication with large numbers of people in a variety of locations and time zones worldwide. So, why use an email and when might it be your best choice? Speed. If you need your message delivered quickly and want a timely response, email is your best choice. Wide distribution. If you want your message delivered to multiple people in different geographical locations simultaneously, email is the best option. Lower formality. If the formality of your message isn't a high priority, or this is just a routine communication, email is the answer. When writing emails, it's important to acknowledge a few important genre features. These include the to and from lines. This one is pretty basic. Like any form of physical mail, you have to label your correspondence with an address, a place where you want your message sent. It's worth noting, however, that unlike physical mail, you must also include a from address. Even if you set up a new email address with a fake name that you want to keep removed from your personal identity, that from line is always going to be there, providing some kind of clues as to where the message originated. Remember, emails are not private the subject line. Perhaps the most useful and important feature of an email, the subject line should be three to five words that explain exactly what the message will be about. Ideally, you can communicate the action you want your audience to respond with in these three to five words. For example, please sign and return attachment. The option to CC carbon copy or BCC blind carbon copy. The term carbon copy is a holdover from when documents were signed on carbon paper as a way of creating copies. Now it simply means sending an email to multiple recipients. If you want to include someone on an email without letting other recipients know, use the BCC function. The attachment button. One of the major reasons emails are so useful in the workplace is the ability to attach large files of multiple types. In this way, emails have taken the place of what may have traditionally been called letters of transmittal. These were short notes included with larger documents or folders that simply explained what the larger file was and why the person was receiving it. Today, this is the information you include in the email, and the bulk of the detailed information is usually included as an attached file. The signature line. You can tell a lot about a person based on how they sign their emails. Many professionals create one standard email signature line that then applies to all of their messages. Perhaps you need multiple signature lines for different accounts, though. For example, when I write emails to my students, I simply sign Dr. B. But if I were writing to a colleague who I don't know very well, I would sign my full name, include my current professional title, as well as things like preferred pronouns and other ways of contacting me. Top tips. Most emails allow you to enable an undo feature that lets you take back a sent email with a short period of time. For example, let's say you sent an email and immediately after realized you forgot to attach the important file. If you have this feature enabled, you can avoid the embarrassing follow-up email and correct your mistake in time. Two, try using Boomerang or other email software. 
There are various programs you can download to improve your email writing. Some are free and some are subscription-based. Essentially, these give you a bit of feedback on things like the reading level of your writing, your tone of voice, and any grammatical issues. These aren't a necessity, but could help you improve your emails in the long run. 3. Write shorter paragraphs, often paragraphs of just a single line. Long blocks of text really have no place in an email. Once you communicate an idea, even if it only takes up a single line, move on to the next paragraph. This creates more white space in your message and makes it much more likely that someone will read what you've sent them. 4. Ask a direct question or make a direct request. Make your purpose known. The virtue of email is that it is a space where you are rewarded for being quite direct. Ask for what you want explicitly. Make requests for action directly. Make these requests visually apparent by allowing them to exist on a line by themselves or perhaps include them in the subject line, like I did in my previous example. Okay, that's your crash course on emails. Hopefully that provides you with enough information to understand how and why this genre of communication is important and when they might be most appropriate. To provide some contrast, let's talk about the great-grandfather of the email, the physical letter. The letter is the most formal of the three professional documents we're discussing today, whereas the email is the least formal. Why? Think about the way in which emails and letters are delivered to an audience. An email is quickly typed, contains concise information, and facilitates a quick response. You can exchange multiple emails in minutes. A letter, however, is usually printed or handwritten. It might be produced on a company letterhead or sealed with a stamp. A letter costs money to send in the mail, and it takes some time to be delivered. Because of these lengthier processes, it's important that letters carry some level of formality and a deeper well of information. Again, being a physical object, a letter in the mail demands a bit more attention from the recipient than an email might, and it's certainly harder to ignore. While the body of the letter will almost always contain more text than an email or memo, the physical letter itself presents limitations regarding how much information you can share at a given time. For example, I can send a packet through the mail that contains a letter and an attached report, but it's much more difficult to send a letter, an attached report, all of the data used to write the report, supplementary materials, etc., etc., in one physical package. With an email, you can link and attach endless libraries of information. You just may not be able to convince your recipient to read it all. One thing you can count on, for the most part, is that your letter will facilitate direct communication with you and a single audience. Mail tampering is a federal offense, so you can usually bet the wrong person won't open your letter. Of course, your recipient can share the information you send in any number of ways, or they can destroy it completely, leaving almost no trace. When writing letters, it's important to acknowledge a few important genre features. These include business letter format. Starting with the header, a business letter typically includes your name, address, the date, then the name and address of your recipient, followed by a salutation. A salutation is just a way of saying hello. While styles range from company to company, one thing is pretty industry standard. Do not indent when you start a new paragraph in a business letter. All paragraphs should be left aligned and create a clean, straight line from the address all the way down to the signature. Paragraph Organization Paragraphs are more detailed in letters than emails, and you'll use the one-line paragraph less often. Because of this, it's very important to use a logical structure when organizing your paragraphs. For example, the first paragraph of a business letter will likely include a sentence introducing yourself in relation to your audience, a line contextualizing the problem, issue, or purpose, and a sentence concluding the paragraph 
that explicitly states what you want the reader to do. Body paragraphs should be tightly organized around strong topic sentences so that if your reader simply skims the letter by reading the first and last sentences of each paragraph, they know exactly who you are and what you want from them. A true signature line. Like in an email, you sign your name and give your title at the end of the letter. If you are printing the letter, be sure to create space for a physical signature with a pen before typing your name. Top tips for letters. 1. Letters are a lot more standardized than emails, so it's generally pretty easy to find clear examples of the kind of document that you want to produce. Cover letters, official requests, letters of complaint, and more are freely available all over the internet for you to study and dissect. Be sure to look at lots of examples before you send your own letter to make sure you aren't leaving out any important sections. 2. Before sending your letter, read each paragraph's first and last line. Do these effectively summarize your main points? If not, Revise to make your letter more skimmable. This could mean adjusting your topic sentences or including visual cues like numbered lists or bullet points. 3. Check your tone. Because a letter is longer and a bit formal, it offers more chances for you to make mistakes with your professional tone. If you are writing to a superior, are you being respectful without sounding like a brown noser? If you are writing to a colleague, are you being congenial while also being direct? If you are writing to an employee, are you communicating urgency and being sincere without sounding too demanding or insulting? Emails and letters should make sense to you almost intuitively because I'd bet you'd have experience writing and receiving both. This last professional document, however, might seem a bit foreign. The memorandum, or memo for short, originated as a way to communicate reminders to larger groups in corporate environments. The word memorandum comes from the same Latin word as memory, so a memo is always responding to something that already happened. For example, if a small committee met and voted on a set of new procedures for how to process refunds, they might communicate this new protocol to their larger financing department with a memo. This is because a memo typically communicates information from the past, something that has already been decided or discussed to a new audience. So, in this example, the committee would send out a memo to everyone in their department and or post one in a public place that states the context of the issue, perhaps the problems with the way refunds were handled previously, the decisions made regarding the new refund protocol, and the actions each person in the department needs to take in order to do their job effectively. Most often, memos will be distributed widely in this way to an audience like a department or working group, perhaps one category of employee, all service technicians for example. Because these documents are meant to be read by a large number of people from different backgrounds, it's important to make memos as skimmable and direct as possible. Use headings, bulleted lists, and bold typeface to help you show your audience the most important information at a glance. When writing memos, it's important to acknowledge a few key genre features. These include the memo format. This format will vary from one professional setting to the next, but as a rule, plan to include a to, from, date, and subject line with all memos section headings, and other visual cues. Get in the habit of using three major headings for your memos. These should be some version of 1. What happened? 2. Why did this happen or why were changes made? 3. Steps to be taken. Use bulleted lists anytime you can to help your reader skim to the most important information. Using bold typeface can help you draw attention to one or two major takeaways. Don't overuse this, however, because it quickly loses potency. Emails, letters, and memos are all clearly different genres that fulfill different purposes. They each have their own strengths and weaknesses. For example, 
The email is faster and presents fewer limitations regarding attachments than the other forms, but it is less formal and more likely to be ignored. A letter can be highly formal and direct given that it's usually addressed to a single person, but it can be slower than an email or memo and costly. A memo can communicate information to larger groups than a single letter, but because it will be received by a larger audience, it must be a highly skimmable document. Emails are great for quick questions and single requests. Letters are ideal for more detailed or formal requests. And memos are best for communicating past actions and next steps to multiple people. Despite their differences, these three documents all share one very important characteristic. They are designed to accomplish a particular purpose for an intended audience, and they are action 